starts to feel very depressed. I'd cry at anything. Um, I was a bit paranoid that people were always walking around talking about me or just looking at me. Um, and I started to get weaker. Um, at first it was just not being able to get up off low beds or chairs. And then it was just all over. Initially when she came in under the medics she wasn't, uh, wasn't eating. Um, was vomiting pretty much everything that, that she did manage to, to, to get in. She first presented it when she was 17 with, with again with loss of weight over a couple of weeks and she was given antidepressants, um, had some physio and, and was given sort of supportive treatment and, and sort of slowly got better and went out on, on, on them I think. Uh, and then basically over the sort of the ensuing two and a half years she had uh, recurrent episodes of, of low mood, again the vomiting, loss of weight, uh, weakness, and was pretty much fine in between. And the only precipitant uh, was this assault when she was 13 and uh, the stress of her, her A-levels. Now, the part, her past, sort of past admissions, she was first, first came in, as I say, in, in, in February 96, and these, these are all medical admissions, with weakness, vomiting, abdominal pain, followed two weeks on from a respiratory tract infection. She'd been on the pill previously, and she had a proximal weakness. She was dysarthric. She had a tender abdomen, hypokalemia and hyponatremia. She was seen by Dr. Wade, who thought possibly she might have a Guillain-Barre type polyneuropathy. She had a CT, CSF, and apparently did have some nerve conduction studies at Charing Cross, which they'd forgotten about. And that was all essentially normal. She can now walk, um, say, 10 metres or so. Um, just about unaided now, can't you? Yeah. yeah. I haven't vomited this time since I've been in hospital, really. The last, the first time, I was still vomiting when I went home. But that stopped within a couple yeah. of weeks. I think that was a marked difference from our point of view. The first time, Diana had been eating normally and then started to vomit and just couldn't, even if she took a, a tablet to stop her vomiting, she'd have the tablet, glass of water, and within two minutes it would be up. And that carried on for some time. Now this time, uh, although there was a little bit, I think, of vomiting yeah, to start first. with, mostly it was not eating. Now whether you didn't eat because you were afraid, you, you just... No, I just wasn't hungry. You weren't hungry, you said, yeah. So it, is, it does appear to be different this time. Um, I just... I'd see people talking and they might just look around the room and I'd think that it was me that they were talking about and that they were looking at me. Did, did the depression, um, did it come on gradually or was it something that sort of, you, know, you wake up one morning and... Um, I think it was I just woke up one morning and just didn't want to do anything. Right. Did, did, did that um, alter in any way as, as the weakness got, got worse, or did it sort of stay more or less the same, or...? I think it was more or less the same. Okay. I mean, can you just, just press down against my hands? Okay. Pretty good. And pull up. Just keep your big toes up. Okay. You just bend your knees for me. Okay. Just push my hands away. Pull them back. Okay, so that's... The knee flexion is obviously very weak. Just pop your legs down straight. Press my hands into the bed. Extension's not bad. Can you lift your legs up? But hip flexion is very, uh, yeah, but hip extension rather is uh, very weak. So extension seems to be more uh, effective and certainly is more proximal than distal. This patient has in fact acute intermittent porphyria, which is uh, one of the group of porphyrias 
which are all characterized by abnormalities of uh, heme synthesis. In this um, girl's case, she has one of the uh, most severe forms and has one of the uh, acute group, as its name would imply, and in fact the worst sort. Virtually all of the porphyrias, and this one in particular, is, are autosomal dominant. However, the vast majority of patients suffering uh, from this uh, illness never have an acute attack in their life. And so uh, often you find there is no family history whatsoever, although one of their parents must have the gene. The vast majority of patients suffer from all sorts of psychiatric symptoms, and in fact anything from psychosis through depression, anxiety, and essentially anything else uh, can present in this um, clinical setting and it's unclear why within a single patient or in a group of patients why one illness uh, predominates or why one occurs at any particular time throughout the course of the illness. The main physical symptoms are abdominal and neurological and these affect the vast majority of patients although not all. Abdominal symptoms are characterized by generalized usually central abdominal pain with vomiting constipation and typically hyponatremia. It can be so severe that it presents to the surgeons as an acute abdomen as was uh, the case in one of this uh, girl's admissions. The neurological symptoms are characterized by typically weakness in the arms and legs, typically more severe proximally and sometimes associated with a sensory neuropathy, again proximally, typically uh, pinprick across the uh, shoulders is impaired, as well as across the thighs. The underlying cause for this is a peripheral neuropathy, which can be confirmed on nerve conduction studies. The other main system that can be affected is the cardiovascular system, and about 70% of such patients also present with hypertension, which can persist even when the acute attack is over. The treatment in porphyria takes a number of forms. Most importantly is to avoid the precipitant of the acute attack. Precipitants can be endogenous or exogenous, endogenous particularly being important the estrogen and progesterone hormones, exogenous obviously being a variety of uh, drugs and chemicals. Once the precipitant is excluded, if the diagnosis is made early enough and if the attack is severe enough, then hemarginate can be given as an infusion over the first few days in association with the biochemistry department. The final prong of the medical treatment is a high carbohydrate diet of approximately 1500 to 2000 kilocalories as carbohydrate in 24 hours. The other prongs of treatment are physiotherapy for the neuropathy and generally supportive measures for any of the symptoms. The psychiatric treatment in particular uh, is based on treating the uh, symptoms. Antipsychotics, typically the older uh, ones such as chlorpromazine, tend to be safe in uh, acute attacks. However, in depression, many of the antidepressants can make an acute attack worse, and therefore it's important to always check with the BNF, which has a table at, at, uh, in one of the appendices, and also to check with the nearest biochemistry lab as to which drugs uh, are or aren't uh, safe. So in summary, this is a diagnosis which is easily missed because of its intermittent nature, but essentially in any patient presenting with a relapsing picture of weakness, abdominal pain and vomiting, and many and varied psychiatric symptoms, then simple urine and blood tests uh, need to be sent away to the relevant reference lab to exclude or confirm the diagnosis.